Welcome, friends, to another world of strange. And this time we are talking about the, 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 my good old hairy beast in the woods, Bigfoot, sometimes known as Sasquatch to uh, the uh, elders of the, uh, of the native lands. And, uh, and I'm joined by a wonderful bunch of people. Uh, and uh, in no particular order, we have Tammy Baird. Hello, everyone. We have Stuart Strauss. Yo. We have John Piricello. Uh, hello. We have Jake <laughs> Wardle. Hello. And we have none other than Christoph Zajek Denik. And I'm proud that I can pronounce that name. <laughs> he hasn't had his breakfast. Let's yeah. watch. So, welcome one and all. So we shall go into it. Uh, the first person up is none other than our friend here, John Piricello. With how the name Bigfoot was born, it's over to you, John. That's going to be good. All right. In the summer of 1958, Jerry Crew was working as a tractor operator for a construction crew in the Bluff Creek area of Northern California. His first indication that something was odd in the woods surrounding the web, the work site came in early August when a 700-pound tire was thrown into a gully as workers stood in awe. But that wasn't the end of it. Soon, Crew began finding giant man-like footprints around his bulldozer when he arrived at work in the mornings. At first, he was skeptical. But as he learned of the many myths and legends of an enormous man-ape creature that lived in those very parts, he soon believed that he had stumbled upon something spectacular. Crew brought the footprints to the attention of his friend, local taxidermist, Bob Titmus. Titmus helped Crew create plaster casts of the prints, and together they took the casts to a newspaper reporter in nearby Eureka. The reporter was the first to call the beast Bigfoot, and soon the images of the giant footprints were all over the world's newspapers. Thus, the legend of Bigfoot was born. Yes. Ooh, I like it. That's crazy. That's that a huge very, tire. That's how it happened, yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's well, a huge tire. 1958, that name was coined, yeah. I think it was. <laughs> well, what, what, what isn't clear to me is the one that, so the workers stood in awe at the result of the tire being thrown in the gully. They didn't watch, I, I can't get an idea of whether they watched the tire getting thrown by the ape-like creature. It doesn't seem like it's saying that. It seems like they came upon the tire and were like, how did this get down here? It's too big. I don't know. What do you, you think? imagine if they actually saw Bigfoot do it? That would have been awesome. It would have been well, but that's what I'm saying. It, was, it, it said, uh, it said uh, the, the first indication was that something was thrown into a gully, was mm -hmm. thrown, there we go, as workers stood in awe. Well, that's a little confusing to me. It it was just no, I had a mobile phone back then to film it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were just so in awe of the aftermath. Like, woo, look at that. Well, have cell phones. <laughs> but even when they've got cell phones, all they seem to get is a blurry image anyway, so they're not much good either. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting point that you bring up, Frank. Uh, we, we hear a little bit less about Bigfoot now that everybody has a high-definition uh, camera uh, carrier that they're carrying around with them. Yeah, Bigfoot, <laughs> yeah they can't get a high-def picture. That's amazing. Yeah, they're always blurry out focus images. It's amazing with all the tech we've got. Yeah, it's, no, it's no. I'm saying, I'm saying now that we have all that tech, we don't even get the blurry images. There are no images, right? When's <laughs> the last time anybody posted anything about Bigfoot? Anything new? Yeah, possibly 2012. Okay, really? according to my notes. Oh, right. I've got a few little things to read here. So. You've got a youth group was Bigfoot. camping in the Marble Mountain Wilderness when leader Jim Mills noticed a strange-looking creature skulking along a ridge nearby. He filmed it for nearly seven minutes, making the somewhat grainy footage the longest video of an alleged Bigfoot sighting. There you go. That's number one. The Marble Mountain. Maybe, maybe Bigfoot has uh, like some sort of telepathic or um, electrical skills to blur uh, film and or electronics. Maybe that's oh. like something. That's entirely possible when you yeah. consider the longevity of Bigfoot. 
maybe you know, yeah, all the so stories and so places they show up. The pictures, uh, an excuse as to why pictures are so shit. <laughs> <laughs> they can blame yeah, who people. knows. Well, meanwhile, in October of 2012, a group of siblings hiking in Provo Canyon thought they spotted a bear in the woods and started filming. When the creature stood up on two legs, the hikers ran, abruptly ending their shaky video. A year later, the siblings launched a Kickstarter campaign to investigate the other Utah Bigfoot sightings. So there's another one. That was 2012. Sounds like a scam. That's quite recent. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> and then locals in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, were baffled by a footprint measuring 17.75 inches found near a residential home in 1980. According to the Associated Press, the footprint coincided with reports of strange noises and a strong but unusual odor in the area. So there you have it. I'm dying for John to comment on that bit. <laughs> you do. What, what would I say, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I can imagine it would be funny. <laughs> well, they didn't Just say the other was offensive, so... <laughs> you on, on, you're trying to say something, John. Come on. <laughs> I just think it's terrible that uh, you know that these they we they smell bad to us. I mean, really, like, what do we smell like to them? You know, that's what I want to know. Yeah, we yeah. probably yeah. Well, yeah. Some humans smell bad to me, so like, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> hey, I didn't write it. Might be you know, <laughs> it's horrible to Bigfoot smells. You don't know. Do you? It can't be worse than traveling the tube in summer. In oh, Island. gosh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. Jake? Yeah, places downtown LA, you don't want to be there. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Certain areas, I would definitely don't want to. Uh, People got to do what they got to do. Stroll down, yeah. Um, Jake, it's over to you, sir, with your description of the Bigfoot. The Bigfoot, yes. So, um, uh, Individuals claim to have seen Bigfoot, describing it as a large, hairy, muscular, bipedal, ape-like creature, roughly six to nine feet, 1.8 to 2.7 meters, covered in hair described as black, dark brown, or dark reddish. Some descriptions include details such as large eyes, a pronounced brow ridge, a large, low-set forehead. The top of the head has been described as rounded and crested, similar to the sagittal crest of the male gorilla. The creature has been reported as having a strong, unpleasant smell. The enormous footprints for which the creature is named are claimed to be as large as 24 inches or 60 centimeters long and eight inches or 20 centimeters wide. Some footprint casts have also contained claw marks, making it likely that they came from known animals such as bears, which have five toes and claws. Proponents of Bigfoot's existence claim that the creature is omnivorous and mainly nocturnal. Omnivorous? So they eat they eat uh, uh, people? They eat Potentially? Meat and, yeah, well, meat and veg, so... There's a possibility for cannibalism. Definitely. Well, no, that... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe well, that's what's happening, is they, they eat each behavior. other, and that's why we don't see them so often, because they're that's just... Cute. Yeah, that could explain why we don't see dead bodies. Yeah. They, 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 they eat them, lunch them all down. You just, John just uh, came up with a shoo moment. They eat one another, therefore see? they're... That's dead. why they, we never find Bigfoot carcasses. That's yeah, there's no bodies found. Yeah. And we never see baby Bigfoot. They eat their own and, uh, and uh, clean up their, their, their own stuff, yeah. Maybe, they're, maybe, uh, maybe it's like an interbreeding between, um, uh, like apes and bears or maybe they're robots from like what, from the six million dollar man there has to some, be some sort of alien of some sort uh mm -hmm. because bigfoots are so they're human they look humany more humany and then i can see the bear reference but um maybe aliens but maybe they're equipped with some sort of electronic technology to just screw up all the cameras that have been pointed at them let me ask you this. Have you ever seen a bear get up on its hind legs? Oh, yeah. 
I don't. Standing on two, even a small brown bear becomes a very large animal. They you can know? be like six foot tall or seven foot oh, tall. Oh, sometimes, more. Like yeah, sure. Even very intimidating to say oh, the yeah. least. Yeah. It depends how they can't walk on their hind legs for very long distances, though, can they? Probably not. But right. if they're frightened or oh, about to attack, they're going to oh, show yeah. you. You know? Yeah. Hmm. Very frightening. Uh, um, Glad we don't have that in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Tammy. Am I up? Okay. You, it's okay. over to you. And this is a first Bigfoot story that's been sent in by a, okay. a, a viewer. So this is my first time reading it, so I apologize. I haven't, this is going to be a cold read. Okay. <laughs> glasses. We are, we, are, we are ready. I had to, I just had to commit and get glasses. Okay. In 2003, a man named Ray and his son Forrest moved into our house located along North Bend Way in North Bend, Washington. Ray was a tribal council member of the, damn it, another word that I cannot pronounce. I should prove for this. Um, this is like an Indian word. Um, S N O Q U A L M I E. Snoqualmie. Say again. Snoqualmie, right? Is that it? it sounds yeah, about it's, right. It's Twin Peaks no. area. It's Twin Peaks no. area. So but it's the Snoqualmie tribe. Yeah, like where the lodge is. Okay, and participated in traditional ceremonies of his ancestors. Whenever tribal enrolled children went into the care of the child protective services ray would be involved in their temporary placement within foster care while ray was living with us three kids from a local family came to stay as their mother was suffering from severe abu substance abuse my son and i got to know the family very well over the next few months one of the children a young woman 16 years old wanted to go camping with her friends at Tikem Road, located near the film site of Jack Rabbit's place, palace. Um, she had a cell phone with her, and I said to call if anything went wrong and that I would pick her up. Sure enough, I received a call at 3 a.m. Through hysterical crying, I made out, come pick me up now. So I threw on my clothes, and drove up there in the middle of the night. Somehow I found her in the dark and there was no directions to go by because the phone cut off before she told me her exact location. As I drove up the road, she came walking down out of the woods and got into the car. I asked, what the hell was going on? And this is a story she told me. We got the tent set up and everyone was getting ready to lay down for the night. The fire was going out, and I thought I'd go to the bathroom once before going to bed. I hiked down to the creek and relieved myself. While squatting down, I heard heavy breathing behind my neck. I turned over my shoulder and saw a large black figure standing five feet behind me. Just on the other side of the creek, the figure snorted and making sniffing noises as if it were smelling me as I went pee. The figure stood nine feet tall and had glowing yellow eyes. I've seen black bears before, and this was not a bear. I screamed and ran back to the camp, grabbed my cell phone with little to no battery, and called you. Later, this woman talked with her grandfather, who explained what she saw. Her grandfather said the other elders explained it to me as well. What I heard was something to Salish tribal beliefs. There is a race of human-like beings that live in another dimension next to ours. The native people call them stick men or stick people. There are numerous stories up until the modern day of people crossing over into the another into the other world or into this world crossing into ours the sick excuse me the stick people are taller than humans with super strength covered all in hair with eyes that glow in the dark some protected sacred sites while others are 
malevolent to have a taste for human flesh. Some guard the wilderness and protect the innocent, like women and children, and show themselves when the women and children are being abused. And others are snap of people, which is one Native American explanation for missing persons reported in the Castane Mountains. This is just the beginning of the subject. J.W. Burns was accurate with his initial report of wild men in the wood near Vancouver, BC. Even though newspapers romanticized his stories and explained, expanded on the truth, Burns was not too far off of the mark with the explanation of his, gosh, there's so many new words for me here. His word, the term we now know as Sasquatch. And this was from Bob Antone. That was a novel to read. Because <laughs> my, my raspy voice, I was like, oh, God, damn. <laughs> what's this new word? Just get through this. <laughs> I apologize. It's, I'm terrible. I think every time I give you a story, I seem to give you the most hardest words to read out from anyone else. <laughs> you know, it's probably words that everyone else <laughs> No, but my vocabulary doesn't. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did great, Tammy. You did. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah, great. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I try. You know about, you know, you're all aware, like Tuolumne Meadows, that's probably a similar pronunciation to that one word you were having trouble with? The Native American oh. names, I think, aren't they? Yeah. I don't know. Tribes or, or they did. Anyhow. That's intense. interesting. Very more than interesting. It was. It was. That's a crazy, that's a crazy and story. it's not yeah. the only story that's that centers around the world of Twin Peaks. Funny. Yeah. We've got one later on with Tammy as well. Around that area. Um, I find it interesting that they've called them stickmen. Stickmen, yeah. yeah. That's a new one on me. I've never heard of them called that until now. now there's a group that got that started group? on uh, on Facebook a while back um, called the Woodsman, or, you know, this guy actually studies like the history of all this lore and wow. puts up pictures from, you know, 19th century, early in the 20th century. <clears throat> all around the world. I'm pretty sure there was some info about the stickmen as well. But oh. so many cultures seem to have something embedded that might be similar to as we know the woodsmen today. Yeah. And uh, you know, as you're saying like stickmen don't sound that far from that. You know? no. <laughs> Other than size of course and girth. Wow. Wood inhabitants, yeah. We have yeah. Mr. Christoph Sajek Denik here. And uh, uh, I don't think he's had his Benadin today. And uh, <laughs> he's going to read Bigfoot names from around the world, as they say in Brooklyn. So here we go. Uh, Sasquatch. We all know this one may be viewed by some as more representative of the Pacific Northwest. Really, it's pretty much interchangeable with Bigfoot. These days, the Sasquatch, the Sasquatch is spotted all over North America, from the thick forests of New England to the mountains of the Pacific Northwest and everywhere in between. Um, the next name is Yowie from the outback of Australia. By many accounts, this guy is yet another version of Bigfoot. In some stories, the Yowie is like an is is an ape-like hominid. Uh, in others, it is more like a primitive human living in the in the outback. Aboriginal legend doesn't clear things up much, but like Native Americans in North America, they do have a history of the creature dating back hundreds, even thousands of years. One problem with the Yowie is that Australia has been isolated for thousands of years. This means whatever factor may have driven the Yeti or Sasquatch to evolve and migrate across Europe and North America can't be responsible for the Yowie. So where did this beast come from? Uh, it's an interesting question with some equally intriguing answers. The next name is... Oh, what? Uh, the next name is Skunk Ape. Uh, this is the Bigfoot of Florida and the southern United States. He's just as big and scary, but ups the bar with the added benefit of a horrific stench. 
It's claimed he gets his illustrious odor by hanging out in the methane-packed bogs, but really it's anyone's guess. With dense and dangerous swamps, parts of Florida and other southern swamps are an ideal habitat for a large creature that doesn't want to be spotted. Bigfoot seems to have uh, made his home here, and who can blame him? The next name, uh, the last name is Yaren. Not urine, people. Yaren. Y-E-R-E-N. This creature lives in the forests of China and is described as something very close to Bigfoot in size and appearance. What's interesting is that the Yaren hails from the general area of the world where uh, gigant Opithecus, the, gi- the ancient giant ape, is to believed to have gone extinct. Equally interesting is that this beast shares a lot in common with the Mongolian almas, also called the Chinese wild man. Reports of this creature go back for generations. Again, like the Sasquatch in North America and the Yowie in Australia, stories often contain a touch of mysticism, making it tough to discern if the urine is a flesh and blood creature or some kind of spiritual um, being dreamed up by local cultures. That's fantastic stuff. I love the name. The Yowie. The Yowie. I didn't realize Bigfoot was so international. And the Yeren. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The Yeren. The Yeren might also be in parts of China, might also be maybe related to the Yeti, because that's another one, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Or the Himalayas, yeah. the Yeti. Yeah. I kind of like Skunk Ape for some reason. Skunk Ape, he sounds like a right foul smelling bastard, doesn't he? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I thought Yetis were like Bigfoots from snowy areas. Am I correct? Because I think I saw a documentary about it years ago when I was a kid. It kind of scared me a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> just imagining yeah. This, this big hairy creature in the snow with big teeth. Oh, well, isn't that the guy from? Uh, isn't that the guy from Rudolph from the <laughs> that animation? Uh, right, Christmas. Yeah, Sagan, definitely. Yeti, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the abominable snowman. <laughs> yeah, because the abominable, the abominable bit was meant to be the smell it emanate, you know, it gave off. Yeah. It was abominable to them. Well, right. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but I do believe it's John Pericello himself with this, a, a story, a remarkable story, way back in the late 20s, about <gasps> Albert Osman. Yes, 1924. Uh, the terrifying tale of Albert Ostman. An an itinerant lumberjack who encountered a family of ape men during a camping trip in the remote forests of British Columbia in 1924. One night, so the story goes, Osman awoke to the realization that he was being carried off, still in his sleeping bag, and that he was unable to wrangle himself free. His captor had him over one shoulder and was moving rapidly over mountain terrain with his hand over the sleeping bag opening. After a couple of hours of this harrowing journey, Osman was released from his sleeping bag confines and claims to have found himself surrounded by a family of Sasquatch. There was an adult man, an adult woman, and two children, a girl and a boy. Yeah, a perfect Sasquatch nuclear family. <laughs> they did not attempt to hurt him, according to Osman, but they made it clear that he was not allowed to leave. Over the next few days, the forest beasts chattered to each other with grunts and monosyllabic utterances, keeping a close eye on their victim. Finally, Osman says he he hatched a plan to incapacitate the adult male by enticing him to consume an entire tin of snuff. Oh, man. As the giant creature writhed in pain, Osman was free to make his escape. After finding his way to a logging camp, where the lumberjacks fed him and gave him shelter, Osman returned home from his torturous trip without telling anyone of his abduction. That is, until 30 years later, he finally told his story after he had heard that several others had come forward with similar tales. The experience haunted him for the remainder of his life, but he never knew why he was taken by the Sasquatch or what became of their mountaintop hideaway. 
Wow. Well, I think they, uh, I think, yeah, they became uh, snuff dealers, I think. Uh, is, is what happened. <clears throat> Again, uh, producing snuff and uh, distributing it among the other Sasquatch. So they were bootleggers. <laughs> so they were bootleggers of snuff. The being carried uh, over someone's shoulder for hours sounds so awful. Oh, yeah. That does sound really scary. You can't see what it might be, and you're trapped in your sleeping bag. That. Yeah. You, and you don't know what's going what on. What's going on? Yeah. Even, like, just who could even do that? Like, in other words, the just the uh, um, I think the idea of like what what entity could even accomplish that known entity, right? Could sling you over its shoulder and run for two hours. That doesn't. Uh, I think that's what I'd be thinking. Like, Jesus, this is not anything I've ever heard of. The same. The, the the uncle of the guy that can pick up a seven hundred seven hundred pound tire and throw it down a ravine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Same guy. I think yeah. we're yeah we're getting a, a a pattern here, aren't we? They like to pick up things, and they're really just with their cross training is what the Sasquatches are doing. <laughs> that really that. makes the most sense. Oh, is it? Should, should we should we come up with should we come up with like a a new exercise fad and call it Sasquatch? Yeah, you just like, throw stuff in their pound tires. Throw someone over yeah. your shoulder, throw a tire with the other hand. Yeah, you <laughs> and run up Sasquatch, uh, Sasquatch Olympics. You know, <laughs> see who yeah. shows up, you know. Oh, so <laughs> cool. <laughs> through the woods. You could invite North Korea for that matter. And, wow. you, and you, have to, you have to wear the heaviest fur suit while you're exercising. That's right. And so you've got you to wear, wear really big feet on your... Yeah, you sweat it all out. Which slows down your running <clears> speed. <throat> it, no. Mm-hmm. The question here is why did did uh, why why what why was he very here? unlucky? Well, we never got to find out, right? Because uh, because this uh, Albert Osman, this horrible uh, man. Uh, Gave, you know, maybe they were just trying to be friends. Maybe they were like bringing him up there to to try to uh, uh, make a bridge the gap between the Sasquatch and human community. And he like throws a bunch of snuff in his face or whatever he did. And so now put his set they set Sasquatch relations back hundreds of years, I think. Yeah, Albert Or um, or maybe because they had uh, little Sasquatch children. Maybe it was a. a a gift for the kids, like a pet, a pet human. <laughs> 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 Look what, uh, don't tell, don't, don't say don't daddy never gave you anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't say I never got you a human. That's right. Hey, I got, but a, but a daddy, the, but daddy, the, the gong blots have a human. How come we can't have a human? Well, that's our new TV show. Next door neighbors got my mom Janice. Yeah. And then the wife is like, you go get, you go get them a human. You go out there and you get them a human. <laughs> a good one this time. It smells good too. We have sneakers on. Don't come back here until you have a human. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. And the next up is Christoph with. Uh, very. Uh, he hasn't got that cough syrup. I have to go. Can you go, <laughs> Tammy? Can you pop out to the drugstore and get him some, please? <laughs> He, he, he definitely needs it. Uh, he's a bit chesty. Hairy chesty. Yeah, like a Sasquatch. Um, this next one is a very famous story. I'm sure many of you have probably seen this in pop- popular culture. The Patterson <laughs> Gimlin film from 1967. So please, Christoph, could you take it away? Absolutely. Here we go. Um, the Patterson Gimlin film, also known as the Patterson film or the PGF, if you're street. Um, is an American short motion picture of an unidentified subject, which the filmmakers have said was a big Bigfoot. The footage was shot in 1967 in Northern California and has since been subjected to many attempts to authenticate or debunk it. The filmmakers were Roger Patterson, born February 14th, 1933 to January 15th, 1972. And Robert Bob Gimlin born October 18th, 1931. Patterson died of cancer in 1972 and maintained right to the end that the creature on the film was real. Patterson's friend Gimlin has also has always denied being involved in any part of a hoax with Patterson. 
Gimlin mostly avoided publicly discussing the subject from at least the early 70s until about 2005, except for three appearances, when he began giving interviews and appearances at Bigfoot conferences. As their stories went, in the early afternoon of Friday, October 20, uh, Patterson and Gimlin were riding generally northeast, which was upstream, on horseback along the east bank of Bluff Creek. At some time between 1.15 and 1.40 p.m., they came to an overturned tree with a large root system at a turn in the creek, almost, high as, a, almost as high as a room. So if you can imagine, that's, that's crazy tall. Um, when they rounded it, there was a log jam, a crow's nest left over from the flood of 64. And then they spotted the figure behind it nearly simultaneously. It was either crouching beside the creek to their left or standing there on the opposite bank. Gimlin later described himself as in a mild state of shock after seeing the figure, after first seeing the figure. The figure had walked away from them to a distance of about 120 feet before Patterson began to run after it. The resulting film, about 59 and a half uh, seconds long at 16 frames per second, is initially quite shaky until Patterson got about 80 feet from the figure. At that point, the figure glanced over its right shoulder at the men and Patterson fell to his knees. On Krantz's map, this corresponds to frame 264. To researcher John Green, Patterson would later characterize the creature's expression as one of contempt and disgust. You know how it is uh, when the umpire tells you one more word and you're out of the game. That's the way it felt. Shortly after this point, the steady middle portion of the film begins, containing the famous look back frame 352. Patterson said, it turned a total of, I think, three times. The other times, therefore, being before the filming began and or while he was running with his finger off the trigger. Shortly after glancing over its shoulder on film, the creature disappeared behind a grove of trees for 14 seconds then reappeared in the film's final 15 seconds after Patterson, after Patterson moved 10 feet to a better vantage point, fading into the trees again and being lost to view at a distance of about 265 feet as the reel of film ran out. Next, Gimlin and Patterson rounded up Patterson's horses, which had run off in the opposite direction downstream before the filming began. Patterson got his second roll of film from his saddlebag and filmed the tracks. Then the men tracked Patty for either one mile or three miles, but lost it in heavy undergrowth. They went to their campsite three miles south, picked up plaster, returned to the initial site, measured the creature's step length, and made two plaster casts, one of each of the best quality right and left prints. That's a long day in the woods yeah, with long horses long. and a bigfoot and filming and running on a film and plaster and horses being lost again and then a creek and like a root system that's as tall as a room and then like all that other stuff i agree it's a it's a, it's a, a lot of effort right that's on. a that's a lot man <clears throat> feel bad for Bigfoot like he's just chilling doing his thing and people are like oh, there you are they chase him and he's like ah! pointing cameras at you guys are like, like, again the paparazzi, the paparazzi again they never leave me like <laughs> 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 and this becomes famous the look you know it's like come on <laughs> he's looking at him like give me a break guys yeah, yeah but that's the original over the shoulder, yeah. yeah. Tammy, what about the Slim Jim commercials where Bigfoot gets back at all the people, though? I mean, like, he, he gets his, they get their comeuppance, like, you know, yeah. they get their... I, uh, I do feel bad, yeah, no. I feel badly <laughs> because, you know, if you are this unique individual and then, you know, the government and people want to make money off of you and they don't really care what's going to happen to Bigfoot after he gets, let's say someone caught him, then he gets, comes back, they're going to dissect him and do stuff. Like he just let him be people, just let him be yeah. We know he's out there and he's not human. He's not from this planet to be able to have lived this long, unless it's different Sasquatches that we're seeing over and over because they all look so similar. <coughs> just, we know he's there. Just wave next time. No photos. He doesn't want a selfie with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
No, there is a sense of, uh, to most animals that live in the woods, they hear you long before oh, you hear yeah. them, right? I mean, yeah. many times there's certain animals you're so rarely going to sight. I would imagine a Sasquatch must have those skills developed, maybe sure. has those skills developed so much more so. Much so. so. Must, know, it, that's its natural habitat. It must have... His senses must be heightened like any other yeah, animal. Yeah, I would think so. Like you know, which it also... knows how to hide well. It knows how to protect itself. You know? Yeah. Hence why there's so many few sightings of it, I guess. Or decent sightings of it. Yeah. Because it's um, clever, you know... I wonder if long before it's like trying to get away and hide. <laughs> You're saying about hiding places. I'm wondering if, if they hide underground most of the time or something. No. Could be because there are caves. There are caves out in the in the. I could I could just imagine a load of them in this cave system. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there are and lots of cave and rock rock areas, you know, out there that they could easily go underground. Maybe. Yeah. Well, what if they have evolved and they're really all the super tall people that are walking around and they've learned to shave or get electrolysis? Like <laughs> <laughs> nice. so, you're saying like the to... um, uh, the giant. Yeah. <laughs> Is, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I spent a lot of years in Lake Tahoe in that area, and I skied at both um, Heavenly and Kirkwood Meadows, you know, both in the Sierras. There's caves all kinds of places. Oh, yeah. There's caves, you know, 10,000, 11,000 feet that'll go back. You know, sometimes it's 20, 30 feet. Sometimes it's much deeper. A uh, great way to protect yourself from the snow, go take a break once you know where they are. Oh, yeah. And most of them are pretty well hidden. So, I mean, those are just the ones I see on a, on a ski slope, you know, let alone the things that are let alone way out, let alone way out there, you know, in exactly. you know, habitable areas. They could easily, yeah. they could easily, you know, uh, 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 hunker down for the winter months or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Like theirs do, you know, come out in different seasons or who knows. Sure. So, you know, they must That's have their, you know, I would think. They've got all these skills, you know, they can sense a human, uh, they can feel it or, you know, just like anything else that might track even. Yeah. And, um, and again, have a lot of ways to hide out or not be seen if they don't want to be. Because they know the area better than the men do, than you Yeah, better than we're ever going to know it. Yeah. Um, Maybe they are actually really good at hiding out. It's just the one or two random that they're like, you don't fit in with us. Go. And they can't. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Like the black sheep of the family. Like you're yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. And they saw an ad on TV and they want to go figure you out. Or road one, and that's the one that gets you know, <laughs> Heading down to the local DQ or something like that. <laughs> Maybe those are the vegetarians yeah. in the bunch. Maybe. <laughs> or like, go do your mission work for a year. And if you can come back. Yeah. <laughs> back with a big bag of canoa or, or <laughs> something <laughs> now we go from like from that area because we hear these stories happen a lot you know in the states and canada but we've got a little bit here about bigfoot in the uk which is going to be read by jake oh awesome Ooh. i can't wait to hear what it's going to be called <laughs> So, chilling accounts of the UK's own Bigfoot are fairly common, and many claim to have spotted a glimpse of an ape-like creature roaming the countryside. One such bizarre sighting has been reported by monster hunter Jonathan Downs, who says he had a very peculiar encounter which he still can't explain today. While investigating a string of sightings at Bolam Lake near Newcastle in Northumberland, he claims to have seen a man-like person leaping through a bog, when it came to dusk on the last day, we were leading. Um, <clears throat> we were leaning on the bonnet of my car, enjoying a cigarette. He went on. Then suddenly, I and three other people I was with saw something very tall. Saw something like a very tall, spindly man moving incredibly fast over about twelve yards. We saw this thing move from right to left and then left to right before it disappeared. It was something I was not expecting because I went in there thinking it would be a hoax. John, who investigates sightings of monsters as a cryptozoologist, added that there's no way what he saw in 2003 could be a person because of the way it moved through the bog. And it isn't the first time people have claimed to have had an encounter with Britain's own Yeti. Earlier this month, 
Massive ape-like footprints with claws caused a stir in Manchester when a dog walker spotted them on the outskirts of the city. John works as a cryptozoologist for the Centre of 14 Zoology and regularly investigates animals which are thought to be extinct and not exist at all. But even he was completely shocked by this sighting. John is convinced that what he saw could not have been anything human. To have a human do what I saw it do would have been an even bigger mystery than what I witnessed, he said. He added, I saw something that I can't explain. So when other people see something similar, I don't mock it. But John is fairly sceptical and says that it may just be a sighting of something which science has yet to explain. He said, the chances of there being a Bigfoot in Britain are almost nil. And yet people keep seeing these things, including me. So the question is, what are we dealing with? John is almost certain that what he saw was something paranormal, but he believes that whether he, whatever he saw might also be what others see when they spot a Sasquatch. Mm. So, what do you think, guys, about that one? Well, I think it's interesting to deny that it's not a Sasquatch. Like, oh, it's impossible for it to live here. But if everyone's seeing it, why can't it be a Sasquatch? I also find it interesting that he... Um, He's denying that it's physically there, but it might be something else. Maybe, you know, he said paranormal of some sort, something that science is yet to be able to explain. Yeah. Well, that, that's kind of like how the mind works sometimes, though, mm. right? Like if you're, not, if, if you're not used to seeing it, sometimes your eyes and your mind can't, can't actually see it or register what it is. Yeah. I don't know. That makes sense, yeah. You're, you know, do you want to believe your eyes or what's it saying? Are you going to believe your lying eyes or what I say? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it goes you back briefly, just briefly. It goes back to the, uh, the stories in the Middle Ages over here of the thing called the Green Man, um, which is meant to be like this kind of, there's, there's lots of stories about it, but um, it's, it's kind of a legend that Bill. Who, Freddy's ancestor? Freddy's ancestor, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's just supposed to be a, 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 a giant um, who is that, like a part of nature, do you know what I mean? That's why they call him the green man, the leaves. And, is that, is that um, where the, the, the green giant... Um, the green giant? Vegetable brand. Sweet corn. Jolly green giant. <laughs> really? Green really? Green 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 giant. Giant. Well, it's probably, yeah, so it probably stems from that. That's amazing. So that was kind of our legend of kind of like a giant in the woods, you know, over in, right. in the old days, you know, and that, that made it, you know, through time that made that maybe, you know, changes into like a Bigfoot kind of creature. Oh, in the story, yeah. when it says the, cha- the chances of there being a Bigfoot in Britain are almost nil, mm. I'm thinking yeah, probably because of the weather. Yeah. Oh, Is it balmy or what's, uh, what's the issue with the weather? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if it's got a hairy, hairy, if it's hairy, it'd be all right in this in our weather, wouldn't it? Because it's always yeah, it cold. Be, yeah. Yeah. So well, maybe it, bugger, yeah. you know, two maybe it, of maybe it yeah. wants some more vitamin D. Maybe, maybe the one in uh, the UK is is uh, a closer relative to the one in uh, the southeast of the United States, and it smells really badly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah because it's because it's so balmy and humid. Is is the uh, well? No, it, it's no. it's snuck on the ship with the original colonists. <laughs> Could be. It's the abominable snowman one. A lot of different shampoos and conditioners out there today, though. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have no idea what you're talking. Just a about suggestion, you know, for <laughs> big thing. Frank and Frank Indeed. and I don't know what you're talking. We, we, uh, we have no concept of that. <laughs> well, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to hear Jake do like one of uh, his next reading. If you have another reading, like with a whole other accent, man. Yeah. Solid up, you know, <laughs> Russian, Southern American. Yeah, and you give me you a story from, a, from another place and I'll, uh, <laughs> if it's one accent I can do, I'll, I'll throw it in. We should make sure that we do one where all of us have to do a different accent. None of us can speak in our... <laughs> yeah, we'll have to try that next time. Yeah. Totally good. Uh-huh. Try and pick one from a different part of the world and we'll have to tackle the accent. That's yeah, exactly. Uh, where I know you might have to cover it up and it'll sound Welsh, Indian and... Australian all in one or something. Yeah, you'll give me like the hardest one. I'll, be like, I'll give you the oh. hardest one, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like a Lithuanian accent or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. A Lithuanian with impossible words to pronounce. Yeah. Yeah, with the worst. Yeah, with the. I just give you a list of really typical words. 
And you have to read them backwards. Even, you know. Yeah, I just like, come on, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's like a, speak. <laughs> yeah. If it's like where I have like a couple days off, I'll, I'll, I'll take the next one, like the script with me to set. So that I can... You need about a week of rehearsal, I think, beforehand. There you go. There we go. Yeah. And now we've got a story for our good friend Stuart here which is a 2009 incident. Yes, actually on June 22nd, 2009, at around 6.30 p.m., a 19-year-old college student was driving on a curvy back road near Rhinebeck, New York, on the way to a rehearsal at a nearby performing arts center. That's according to the BFRO report. As he swerved to miss an object on the road, a shopping bag containing, oddly enough, an open cereal box and a small log. He glanced in his rearview mirror and saw someone or something darting behind his car, apparently to retrieve the bag. A moment later, the student stopped and turned his car around and got a three to four second glimpse of something walking on two feet about 50 feet or 15.24 meters away. He described the creature, which he saw from the rear and side profile, as being between seven and seven and a half feet, that's 2.1 to 2.2 meters tall, covered with black hair and possessing broad muscular shoulders with arms that swung in an exaggerated fashion and palms that faced upwards. The witness recalled that he felt nervous, confused, and excited at the same time during his brief encounter. Holy moly. There you go. I mean, if you ever came, if you were ever, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate to come across one of these things, I can't imagine what would be going through your mind at that point. Would you even be like questioning what you're seeing, you know, because it's it's just so out of out of place. You know, you've got nothing to compare it to, and suddenly it's just something like that comes out in front of you. Just seeing for a couple of seconds, how the hell would you comprehend that? This one was I, interesting because it described arm movements, wasn't it? Like erratic arm movements. Yes. Yeah, yeah like big, you know, swinging arms off. I was it frailing at folders. Frailing or just swinging them, you know, um, or was it like going, you know, like this? I would say downwards is kind of the impression I got. Arm, arm, arm re- swinging. Like a, yeah, just letting them swing naturally. Like an ape does that, doesn't it? Does it, it swing its arms when it walks or when it's just in? It's like the momentum of swinging. Doing its walk yeah. Something. Yeah. Yeah, especially while that. running. You know, if he's running behind a car, those arms are swinging pretty oh, free. Yeah, yeah. Because that would frighten the heck out of me. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine. Um, yeah, I don't ever want to come in. I would think if I were to see that, I'd be like, one, am I dreaming? Two, I, did I walk onto a movie set? <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Just get in that car and drive as quick as possible. <laughs> and if Have I did, you... it would happen to me. No one would be around and be the one time I left my phone somewhere. I'd be like, yeah, come have, on. There'd be no other witnesses with you. No, no, no one's going to believe it, are they? Yeah. No. Guess what I just saw? They'd be like, yeah, all right, mate. Yeah, I'm like, no. really again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I did with my good eye. <laughs> T- Tammy, I do believe you got our last um, true Bigfoot story sent in. Right. It's around the the, uh, the Twin Peaks area of stuff. Of, of, uh, okay. America. Yeah. Twin Bigfoot. All right. Let's see uh, if I get through yeah. this. <laughs> I almost feel like now it's going to be like, how many words is she going to say incorrectly? <laughs> Be like sent I'm going to try and help you if, I, if I'm familiar with the names. I'll try and help. <laughs> awesome. All right. Okay. I'd always heard stories of Bigfoot growing up in the Seattle area. Our hometown was especially known for sightings and footprints. One night, my friends and I decided to walk to town. It was the summer of 1988, and the evening was pleasantly warm. We started past Mount Sai Motel. Yes, of Twin Peaks fame before FWWM was ever filmed there. Down Mount Sai Road, just before the Middle Fork Bridge, seen in the background during season three of Twin Peaks, when beat up and bloodied woman crawls out of the woods and kids playing find her hysterical call 911. 
So just before the Middle Fork Bridge, we turned left onto the old railroad bend, which is now called Iron Horse Trail. Right on the corner to our left was an empty field. And as we began to walk into town, something was moving in the business, excuse me, in the bushes along the trail. I figured it was a raccoon or perhaps a cow or horse eating grass on the edge of the pasture. As we neared the spot, things got quiet. Suddenly, there was a loud groaning noise that came from behind the bushes. It was so shocking that it took me a few seconds to realize what just happened. I can only describe it as seeing something low and guttural between a moan, whistle, and a howl. I'd heard bears and cougars before, and this was not like, and excuse me, not anything like that. All of us in the group took off running as fast as we could back to the house. My friend Isaac was pretty tough and wasn't afraid of much. He wore a leather jacket and found himself in fistfights more often than not around town. When we got back, I tried to talk about what we had just heard, and Isaac refused, said, I don't want to talk about it. Another friend that was with us, Vince, said he had heard the same thing over near Ernie's Grove. Again, Isaac told us to shut up about it and never bring it up again. I remember being really confused because the howl sounded human. I remember feeling like we needed to call the police because the voice sounded so much like a wounded person, but at the same time, non-human. No stories of injuries or dead persons or animals were reported in that area for the next week. In 1988, this was still a small town, and even if a cow was sick and died, we would have heard about it. Definitely not a sick cow. Holy. Yes. What I, holy. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, I wish I could get, I could talk to Vince. I'd like to talk to Vince about this story. I'd be like, Vince, tell me your perspective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what would crazy. you speculate that might be? Sasquatch. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, you know, it's, it's crazy. Um, hold on a second. I might cough. That's the thing. I think sometimes sounds can be even more creepier than images. Oh yeah, you much more so. Sound it just really goes through you. Yeah, all your imagination at that point. Your imagination on top of it, just like can't quite comprehend where it's coming from, what it is. Yeah. In that moment, if you're feeling anxious at that moment. Yeah. You you could. Uh, I'm wondering, has there any? Stop to believe in what it is. You know, there's been loads of like random like you know video clips of supposed bigfoot sightings i'm wondering if there's been any like supposed audio clips of oh there is there's lots if you look on youtube Are there? if you look on youtube and put um sasquatch audio or whatever there's loads of stuff on there did there's any of it the fa- there's a couple of famous ones that was that story there's a famous one that was recorded a couple of they're called the sierra sounds it's like supposed to be the most famous recordings and they were done in the early 70s and they picked up what they call Sasquatch language. Um, they had some phonetic expert or something breaking it down and slowing it down and doing all sorts of things. Like that. And they reckon there's some kind of language that they have. It's interesting. Uh, That's, yeah, very interesting. So when, it, when it's spoken, it's very fast, but only when you slow it down, you can hear, not, they're not talking English, but you can hear some sort of, it sounds like they're conversing with one another. You can hear a female and a male one having what sounds like an argument. Maybe over Whoa. food or something. And it's, you want to hear it. It's called the Sierra Sounds. It's fascinating. By a, some guy called Ron. Ron. Um, oh, his name's gone. If they have their own. He's done loads of talks about it, and he's got these recordings that were done on a conventional cassette recorder back in the 70s. They, obviously, they didn't have high tech stuff. God. But, um, my goodness. Today, it's so have easy. Their own, um, languages. They yeah. must have their own. Accents as well. They reckon they sounded like um. The only way to describe yeah. it, they sounded, yeah. sounded like regional dialects. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. In uh, Manchester. So they're in, they're in Manchester. Go. As opposed to. Thank you. 
Oh my God, I love Yeah, Squatch has left the building. <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah, so I think they do have regional dialects, so, um, but, but this particular one, the Sierra one, and I don't know where the Sierra, where is the Sierra Mountains? I, I, uh, east of Los Angeles, several hundred miles, just due east. Well, interestingly, they, they, said they, didn't have a, they didn't have a regional dialect. They said they sounded like samurai chatter. You know, I don't know, I don't know, like that. Like samurai, you know, like the, yeah. you know, those really bad um, dubs. Hey. Yeah. Uh, like that. It's really yeah. bizarre. Well, I wonder how many how many people that have spent their lives in the mountains and outdoors mm. have actually reported Bigfoot sightings? Yeah. I'm going to say, you know, not to be the skeptic, but I'm going to say very few. Yeah. It's this people. is coming mostly from visitors, people that aren't really from the areas yeah. or things like that. Right. I mean, I some mean, are certainly local. I'm sure up in North Bend. I know they're incredibly places. difficult, Stuart certain subjects that we're going to be tackling on this are going to be very difficult to get first-hand accounts from people. Because oh, of family. course, of course. You um, know. So when, you, when I asked for people to send in stories of Bigfoot, I knew I was going to have a problem from my friend's circle because as chances are they would never have come across one of these things, you know, or maybe yeah, never, don't even live anywhere near where they're reported. So it was, a, it was a tall order, you know. And all, yeah. you know, the other thing they'll say is, are you serious? Bigfoot? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I was up against it. But I managed to get two stories from the, that guy you, you, you read oh, out. Uh, um, and he does Bigfoot tours out there as well. He organizes oh, wow. Bigfoot tours. In, in the Sierras, you're saying? Around that, the, the uh, North Bend or wherever area. Oh, North Bend, okay. Yeah, he's from that, he's from that, he's from that part of the world. Wow. Some army or, um, I, wonder, I wonder if Bob talks to Isaac still, because <laughs> if Isaac told them twice, like, don't bring it up again. Like, shut up. Like, um, I'd be curious to see if Isaac had also had a previous experience um, before this day in 1988. So, yeah. you know. Uh, thanks so much, Stuart Strauss. Thank you so much, Tammy Baird. And thank you, Jake Waddle. And awesome. thanks also to John Piricello and Christoph Zajek Denik. I love saying that, man. <laughs> what, a, what, what a name that is, yeah. Um, okay. thanks, so, thanks so much for being here. Next time we are going to be talking about the Black Eyed Kids, mm. not the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> so I, hope you, I hope you'll be uh, uh, along for the ride next time. So until then, I hope you enjoyed this one, and we shall see you all soon. So goodbye from my, my friends here. Bye, everybody. Thanks Bye, everybody. for watching. Yeah, hey, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Take care, guys. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye.